Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 696 with John Alexis. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, John Alexis. Alexis, my man, John, are you feeling unstoppable today? Dude, I woke up unstoppable. <laughs> yes, that's what we like to hear. So John Alexis is the owner of TJ Seafood Market with two locations in Dallas in Malibu Pokey with two locations in Dallas and one location in Austin, Texas. TJ Seafood Market is celebrating 30 years as a family owned business under Alexis's vision. TJ's has expanded from a neighborhood favorite fish market to two award winning restaurants with fish markets plus a robust catering company i can't wait to find out how you built that out and then we got malibu pokey which is john's fast casual pokey concept known for its uber fresh ingredients Uh, malibu pokey also features a unique tech-based self-serving kiosk which allows guests to choose a facial recognition feature that remembers them uh and their order so i kind of Looking forward to unpackaging how that's been working for you guys. And this is going to be a great interview. I have a gut feeling. It's dude, going to be a good one, dude. Every I know interview it you've ever done has led to this. <laughs> right? This is, the, this is the peak of my career right here. I can't wait to dive into it. So with all that said, let's get the motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Um, the longest journey begins with a single step. Uh, Lao Tzu. Ooh, I like it. And uh, we, we get so focused on the destination, how intimidating that can be. And while you were sitting worrying about it, if you had just taken a couple steps, you'd be closer. I dig it, man. How does that resonate with you and what you've done here? Um, it's funny. I mean, if somebody said to you, okay, you need to take your parents' antiquated uh, fish market and turn it into a restaurant company, I would say, I have no idea how to get there. Yeah. Uh, I would be lying to you if I said, and this was our vision board and we went just, it was more, um, I've got kids uh, who watch Frozen 2 uh, do the next right thing. <laughs> it was every day kind of, well, this seems like the next thing to do and this seems like the right next thing to do and then you wake up and, yeah. and that's where you are. I dig it, man. Um, yeah, just start, right? I think sometimes we were so, was analysis by, or paralysis by analysis or I can't think I got those backwards but if you just overthink it, you never start, you just gotta get out there take the leap and get going, right? Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> not Lao Tzu, but you, uh, who was it? Was it uh, Gretzky? You miss all the shots you don't take, Exactly, right? dude. I love it. Great stuff. Great way to get this thing started. So where does it make sense to start telling your story? I know that you got into this industry. Your parents purchased a business from another couple. Maybe yeah. take it from there. Is that yeah, a good so, starting point? Um, I was actually in the, my background was uh, political campaign management, uh, political advertising. Uh, that was what I went to school for. Okay. Uh, my parents, uh, to retire from corporate America, bought a bought the neighborhood fish market. They were customers from just about the first year it was open. Um, I love food. I've always loved nice. food. I love being around it. I don't, I'm not a cook. I'm not, I had no professional aspect to it. I found myself helping my parents out on the nights and the weekends. Uh, and the more I was around it, the more I loved it. And like everybody else, um, you know, as <laughs> being the real world is hard. Being buttoned up nine to five is hard, and suddenly I was like, "Wow, I could be the weirdest, uh, weirdest guy in my office, where I could be like the straightest arrow in the food <laughs> business." I was like, um, oh, "So uh, being around my parents, I just loved it, and it got to the point where I kind of said, you know, mom and dad, uh, I think that the food world is changing, and I think the customers are changing. There's a whole generation of people really interested in food, and I really think that seafood is an underserved yeah. aspect, especially in Dallas, Texas. Oh, yeah, landlocked. And I want to kind of take our family business and do a lot more with it. Can you timestamp this? When were you to- having this conversation? In about, uh, what are we, uh, 89, uh, 2000, uh, 2009. 2009. Yeah. So going on like over uh, – like 12 years ago, or sorry, yeah. 11 years. So um, I'm curious. You already kind of mentioned it, but I want to see if we can pull back a layer or two. Um, you said you love the industry, and I was going to ask you why you love the industry, but it sounds like you love the industry because it lets you be who you are. Is With, that kind of what I, did I picked that up right? Without a doubt. Um, the f- uh, it, I can't sing. I can't play bass. I can't do any sort of way to express myself creatively. That's not I, – I don't have those – I don't have a jump shot. I don't have any of that. Um but food is a really neat way. Humans are hardwired to connect over food. Yeah. And it gave me a language to express myself that I didn't know that I needed. And yeah. I, did, I didn't even know that that was possible. Yeah. And the other thing I, that I think is just magic about this industry, and you highlighted it, is that in other industries, corporate industries specifically, like we have to kind of 
you know, show up with that like professionalism, which is nothing wrong with professionalism, but there's also a certain level of professionalism where we can't be ourselves, right? We have to be so professional that we have to filter who we really are. And one thing I love about this industry is that we kind of tend to embrace the the freakier you are, the better. You know what I mean? The more today we do. I don't <laughs> yeah. I don't know that that was always the case. There was the um, there were only two kinds of restaurants, right? There was fine dining where you you couldn't have a visible tattoo and you were really putting on a show. But even in the back of house, In though, the back of the house, different yeah. story, right? <laughs> and today, if anything, there's almost, I mean, people walk in and they're looking for the the food show. Mm. They want, if, if, they're, if their chef doesn't have enough tats, like they didn't get the experience they were looking for. It's almost become, um, it's, there's almost become a cliche of we're play acting this. No, it's almost gone so over now that we all have to play act this idea of this super creative expressive person in the restaurant business right. um, I think that uh, what you said just being yourself yeah. being, being able to not, not play a character but just be yourself yeah, yeah I dig it so we started talking a little bit about what was going on here you, you thought that you know, there was an opportunity within Dallas uh, to, to really lean into the underserved seafood market um, what was going on before that? Your, your parents purchased this, you said, yeah, from somebody else. They, they thought their customer was um, little old ladies who were running their errands, grabbing a loaf of bread from the bakery and grabbing a piece of fish and going home. And they kind of thought that that's who cooked. Mm. And I saw this you whole, know, new generation. whole new yeah. generation of people who have never been more interested in food, who have access, uh, who have, you know, 15 years ago, if you wanted ramen, you better hope you knew somebody who knew the ancient ramen <laughs> secrets, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Now you are a YouTube video away from being able to... Master if, it. To mas- Maybe not master, but at least to, make some good home. To ramen. have the information, the resources available exactly. to you if you want to put the time and effort yeah. in. And I would be lying to you if I said I had a crystal clear vision of that, but I felt something. I felt like, wait, there's a whole generation of people really, really interested in food. And I've got the... I, there's something mysterious and interesting about seafood. It comes from under the water. You literally can't see it. There are over a thousand edible species of fish in the Gulf of Mexico alone. Right. We know more about space around Earth than we do about what's at the bottom of the ocean. It's crazy. Man. And so I just think of everybody's passion for not only uh, you know, check a box in, on our food culture, right? Um, where our food comes from, the health benefits. Who is sourcing it? Seafood is like the most interesting aspect of any of those. The connection between the fishermen and the ecology of, of bringing fish in. It just, I thought, I thought seafood was so ready for people to not be scared of it. Yeah. And I could be this kind of apostle um, spreading the gospel of seafood. I and, dig and, it, man. And I do. That's awesome. So it was around 2009 that you had this conversation with your parents being like, Mom, Dad, I think there's a market we're missing. I, I really want to take this thing to the next level. What did that conversation look like? Uh, show up with a check. You can do whatever you want. That's what they said to <laughs> you. They said that that sounds like a younger man's game. They yeah. said you, uh, they gave me the uh, mom and dad speech about risk and just because you, you don't think you oh you call it you got your college <laughs> lessons you think you no it's more than that money's real and this is not hypothetical and uh, you think you're so smart you are welcome to take on the risk uh, well it's our risk no you know it's the not under while well, you're living under my roof not on our dollar so yeah. <laughs> well while I pay for the roof over this fish market you're not going to be you know <laughs> yeah. but um but you know uh, I, and I did I, I showed up with a check and I said uh, I, I'll take I, I really believe in this how much did you think you were going to need to to you know, execute this vision. First, get really specific about the vision. Like at this point, what did you want to do? What were the things you wanted to do in 2009? Um, so in 2009, I believed that the city of Dallas essentially had two kinds of seafood restaurants. There was what I quote, fine dining, which is put on pearls and heels and you go out with a bunch of fuddy-duddy old people and you have a, you know, a very Surf expensive, yeah. but well, no, this was more like you could go get a very, very expensive fresh seafood meal yeah, or you could get a cheap meal Red that lobster. was kind of <laughs> mediocre product. Yeah. What there wasn't uh, was kind of doing away with all the, it didn't have, you didn't have to put on a, sp- why did, I guess, better, better way, why do you have to put on a sport coat and get a fresh piece of fish? You took the out of it. Yes, it was, you, you, there was. It was either super, super snobby, rich, or crap. And I believed. I said, when you go, you know, I was laugh. You, we, you go to a seafood restaurant in a landlocked area. 
you got the net on the wall, and it's Captain Willie's Chowder House, and our mateys, how are you doing today, <laughs> yeah. right? It's theme time. Yeah. When you go to the beach, and you go or coastal, and you go to a seafood restaurant, they don't have a picture of the beach because there's the beaches out there. Yeah. They don't have a net. You don't have to. It's just a casual, nice place you can walk in, and you just assume the fish is fresh. And I said, why don't we have that in depth? Da- Dallas, Texas. So why didn't we have that in Dallas, Texas? Because seafood is expensive, and the belief was that um, if I don't give people, we we always call it like the seafood steakhouse, like Sinatra playing, um, giant Napa cabs in the wine cellar, and wainscoting everywhere, and it's like just a steakhouse, but they serve fish, right? And people thought if we didn't give people that experience, then they wouldn't pay the price points of what it costs to bring in fresh fish. Okay. And... um, I think that right around this whole time is when we saw that great food didn't have to come in the fine dining packaging. And I think that is what liberated so many people and in this business. Yeah, uh, and this, you're, you're identifying that period. Like the, it was basically the, 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 the smartphone kicked it off, right? With our ability to get access to anything from this thing that's in our pocket, right? And everybody started getting curious about, especially around food, because restaurants around the nation are now on Instagram sharing what they're doing throughout the nation. You can see what your competition is doing all around the world. And it was around this time that we started taking the pretension out of the, the restaurant's but focusing on quality, but making it more approachable, right? So, like, your, your, your average Joe wouldn't feel uncomfortable walking into a high-quality place. Um, and I think that uh, I think David Chang was so yeah. ahead of the game on that, right? Yeah. Uh, David Ch- uh, it, I think it, it was fu- it, a fine-dining restaurant. Food is, like, well down the list. It's about the experience and about being catered to in the Downton Abbey. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, you know, bowing kind of thing. <laughs> um, it's a very much a. It's almost like a class hierarchy kind of thing. Yeah. And then, you know, there are plenty of restaurants where you can go in in shorts and a t-shirt and spend five hundred dollars. Yeah. It's not. It's not. In no way would we want to uh, forget the privilege of being able to eat this way. There are yeah. people who can't even figure out where their next meal is yeah. coming from. So you painted this picture of what you wanted to create, the market that wasn't being served. How? What was your your strategy for executing this? Well, like get aerial real quick. Like, well, how did you think you were going to pull this off? Um, I believed that, um, so the the seafood industry is rife with fraud, and I believed that if somebody walked into a place and they saw a fish case full of glistening fresh fish, and a man in a chef coat who was a culinary school graduate standing behind that fish case, that there was an instant, you know, no one walks to the butcher and says, is that steak fresh? When did that steak come in? Is it really fresh? There's an inherent distrust of yeah. seafood. That, yeah. And I felt if we took the world it, uh, uh, industry rife with fraud and instead became the most transparent thing where, hey, look, that's that fish. Look, hey, tonight, today we have a golden tile special. You want to go see what the golden tile looks like? Go look. It's in the case. Yeah. And I felt like if we did that, that would really get people past this inherent distrust of I'm in a landlocked city and I can't get fresh seafood. Yeah. All, all I can think of while you're sharing this is the hard way is often the best way, right? But when we when we choose to do it the hard way, which is the right way, show your work. You know, be as transparent as possible because that's going to be your, your unique selling proposition. That's going to be what gets people to, to trust you, right? We always like we. <laughs> I always laugh that uh, somebody tells us, and you said talk about showing your work, right? Um, you go in a place and they say, "Oh, we do a house made blah blah blah." Okay, well, is it better? Is it better than the commercial made? If not only show your work, but also why are you doing it the hard way? Is it for ego? Is it to be able to say you did it the hard way? Is it so you can put it on the menu that it was made in house? Well, is it better? Is there, is it, uh, so our belief was by being transparent and by, by showing our work, they would then taste the difference. If yeah. it was all, if it was all a come on, if it was all a facade, then it wouldn't work. Yeah. But if they then sat down and said, "Oh yeah, this is what fresh fish tastes like," and I didn't have to put a blazer on to come get it. Yeah, and I love that you tagged on to that with why. So, a combination of keeping it transparent, doing it the hard way, showing your work, and then also one thing I think that you've done well through my research, I picked up on this, is your the educational process. Um, and explain to your people why you do it a certain way, right? It's, it's one thing to go through the trouble of doing it the right way, but then explain it, right? Educate why? why. Yeah. If not, it, um, so there's a term we use in our in here at uh, TJ's in Malibu, we call uh, juggling. Juggling is very hard. It serves no purpose but to show that you can juggle. We say um, here is, if everything we do, if it's hard, it better end up making the guest experience better or yes. why are we doing yes. it so again what if your 
house-made hot sauce isn't better than Tabasco. Yeah. You're just juggling. Yeah. Right? You just want to tell people that you make your own hot sauce. So do, do Did you, you taste pro- it? Right? Yeah, do you have a process that you can share with our listeners and how how you and your team goes through the like that that whole step-by-step way of letting the people know why and how like is there a checklist you guys follow or is it just more of like a gut feeling or are you just intentional with like shining the light on this like how do you guys manage showing people the why behind what you do um if we say if we can't describe it to the guest in three words why we do something then it's too complicated or it's not being conveyed okay. we kind of use a three word it's a three if we can't explain why in three words it's fresh. You know, literally, it can be as simple as, um, for instance, um, when a fish comes in, we, all, we try to get our fish in whole. We will fillet the left side of the fish and keep the right side of the fish on there until we need it. It may be three hours later. The Lord above made the best vacuum sealer on earth. It's called skin. Yeah. And literally, that's three hours of lack of air. Okay. To explain that to somebody when they order their salmon of why we did it that way is, at this point, you've already lost me. I came to talk to my spouse here. Yeah. Like, I don't want your seafood lecture. But if we can explain to them that we, you know, very simply, um, we never cut fish into the last possible minute. Okay, that was five words. Yeah. But at least somebody can, I can wrap Close my head around enough, that. Yeah. Right, I can wrap and my head around that. more, they'll ask. Why? Yeah. Yes. It, we, it, there's the headline version. There's the body version and then there's the uh, fine print version. So the lesson right? I'm pulling from this is distill the message as simple as possible. So you can so you don't lose people in the minutia. I told you I come from a political advertising background. Yeah. If it doesn't fit in a bumper sticker, it's too complicated. <laughs> I, I dig it, man. Uh, so you, you, we, could, we used to laugh about people. You'd get in the debate and they'd talk to you about, oh my gosh, well this committee, blah, 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 blah. And the guy on the other side would say, I'm going to lower your taxes. And, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like, it, 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 don't lie if you're yeah. not going to lower their taxes, but don't make it more complicated. If you Just tell them you're lowering their taxes <laughs> if that's what you're going to do. Yeah, I, I dig it. So um, one thing we haven't tapped into, which I was kind of hoping, I love that you're just manhandling that mic. I always tell my guests to grab onto the mic, move it to where you want it. I don't think you've let go of it once since we've been uh, here. I'm, I'm hanging on for dear life. I feel like I'm going to fall <laughs> off the table. I love it, man. It's great. So um, – one thing I'm curious about, so you kind of paint, you paint to the picture as the vision, as the why you wanted to do what they're doing, how the market was being underserved, how you wanted to be transparent and all this, but what was it going to take? Did you have a, because you said you had to write a check, so did you go through the process to estimate like what, what that check was, what the number was going to be? Yeah, um, my, uh, you know, internally my parents had, uh, it obviously it was a friendly, it was a friendly yeah. inner family uh, thing and my parents were able to kind of let me stretch some stuff over time, but I mean, it was a very grown up um it was a very grown-up transaction in that it was like, no, these are real dollars. Like, this is not just... Where'd you go to get the money? I mean, some people go to friends and family, but now the person you're trying to sell to, not sell, well, you're selling the idea to your parents, but who did you go to to kind of make uh, this happen? We, uh, so I had to be a grown-up and go to a bank. Oh. And um, I will, if, if banks tend to say no, especially well, in the food 2009. business. 2009. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, a, if, you can, uh, if you can convince an underwriter at a bank then you probably, they're going to be a lot harder than anybody else. And yeah. uh, debt is scary, and I don't recommend debt for everybody. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't have the confidence to go in front of an uh, equity investor at that point. I had, I would rather take 100% of the, ri- uh, probably the worst business way you could do this. For something I'm unsure of, I'd rather the 100% of the risk be on me yeah. than go spend someone else's money and not know what I'm doing. Once I feel confident knowing what I was doing, then I felt comfortable asking for, for equity investments. Okay. Um, Which is, as I said, that Wall Street operates on the complete opposite 180-degree principle. Yeah. I guess that's why they're richer than me. <laughs> right. But uh, I think the, that's the right the risk hum- other people. I think that's the right yeah. human way to do it. No, I, I agree, man. So um, did, were, you, were you accurate with the number that you projected? Did you end up going over? Never enough money. Yeah. Never enough money. I knew the answer. Yeah. Yes. No. Um, we uh, there were some slim cash flow, uh, Robin Peter to pay Paul months as I figured out how to do all that, and uh, but it, we never ran out. So so how did that whole process go? From you know you, you got the money, you got the loan. I'm assuming yeah. that the bank approved you. Um, the um, uh, one of the things I did uh, was hire a virtual CFO. Okay. Um, I wow. didn't know what uh, that sounds a lot crazier than it is. Really, just someone who's kind of like a. Uh, uh, coach, uh, uh, yeah, at an hourly basis, obviously a restaurant tour, but just to say, kind of force from the trees of this is how debt works, this is how equity works. Here's some best practices of you don't want more debt. Where did you that. go to find this virtual? Um, CFO? This company was called VCFO.com, VirtualCFO.com. Okay. Um, at the time, it, it uh, virtual CFO was kind of there, not, but you can find kind of hourly contract consulting people. Can you hit that website one more time? It was, uh, the company was called VCFO. VCFO. Okay. Yeah, and uh, they were all over the country. Um, and uh, just some, you know, we get so 
we get so into these numbers and we're so emotional. Someone to say, I've seen a thousand of these. Yeah. 900 of them didn't work because of this. Yeah. Watch out for yeah, that. You need that outside perspective, especially from somebody who's seen, like you said, hundreds or thousands of these examples. They'll see things that you just wouldn't be able to pick up on on your own. Um, it's like going to the doctor, right? Yeah. You're obsessed with you're obsessed with whatever crazy little symptom you're feeling. The doc, that's the tenth one the doctors heard that day. They, yeah. they, I mean, you just need that outside perspective. So, you, in 2009, when you had the conversation, when did you actually start building things out? How long did this process take? Um, by 2000, and uh, so when I took the business over from them in 2009, uh, step one was uh, learn how to run a business. Okay. I had gone from being an employee in a different industry to now uh, owning yeah. and. and <laughs> Uh, so uh, so much of it is not exclusive to restaurants. It is how to own a business. Yeah, there's a uh, lot. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's a business. There's some unique aspects to the restaurant industry that not all industries might have as much. They might not rub up as much against these things. Like, look, everybody, especially you know, in the movies and TV show, a re- restaurant tour, it's all wine tastings, and you know, it's not. It's insurance. It's bookkeeping. It's all of that. Yeah. Um, Systems, 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 systems. Wait, it's ne- I think this is going to be good stuff, but yeah. like I'm kicking myself right now because I Go. think there's another layer we can pull off from Please. the CFO experience you had. When you got him or her. Um, this was a him, but there's plenty yeah. of hers. Um, when you got him, what were the things that he brought to your attention that you would have never otherwise known or things that were under your radar that he helped bring to the surface? Um, some basic budgeting. Um, really, uh, systems. We always, he, he told me something that was really smart. He said, I'm not going to solve your problems. I'm going to help you build a problem-solving machine. You put the problems in the problem-solving machine. You maintain the problem-solving machine. What is the problem-solving problem machine? Problem-solving machine is a strategy or a system of how, I priorita- how you prioritize things, how you... Um, so, for instance, how, how you look at a problem, how you identify a problem, and how, you, how you're going to solve that problem. Um, on a, let's say on a smaller scale, not on a CFO level here, you know, um, we always say, uh, let's say problem ran out of silverware at eight o'clock in the middle of Friday night dinner. Um, solving that problem is buying more silverware. The problem solving machine is a weekly inventory where you always have a par and you always know you order more every week. The symptom was running out of silverware. The problem was not inventorying every week. Yeah. So learning to stop solving individual, well, not stop solving individual problems, but focus on your internal controls of how you solve whatever tomorrow's problem is going to be yeah. and maintaining the quote problem solving machine and not just always trying to solve the problems. Or I feel like another way to say that is like solve the problem once. Yes. Uh, we always say um, <laughs> uh, um, permanent solutions to temporary problems, not temporary solutions to permanent problems. Yes, I love it. I'm happy that I asked you to go deeper on that. Thank you. Um, so moving forward, identify, okay, so you got the money, you got the CFO, you have a plan, you have your strategy, you have, you have your, your problem solving system. Um, you're and, open. And then I literally spent years <laughs> learning how to manage a business and f- flying fresh seafood across the country and getting it on an ice and selling it before it goes bad is like, uh, it's Logistics. like, it is, the food business is hard. Yeah. This is one of the most challenging aspects of the food. Everybody says, oh gosh, restaurants are impossible. Don't do it. And then within the restaurant world, everybody says, stay the F away from yeah. seafood. <laughs> like what? It's, it's the hardest aspect Short of, shelf life. Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's, it's a very challenging aspect of a very challenging industry, yeah. right? So, um, so, but like anything else, um, if you are a can, you know, a mountain, uh, you know, the marathoners who all run at high elevation, and then when they get down to sea level, they're like cruising. <laughs> yeah. I le- I just, and again, didn't plan it this way, but learned the hardest aspect of the food business, and um, without knowing what the hell I was I doing. Mean, that's the, I mean, the ign- ign- ignorance is bliss, right? And the yeah. power of relativity, right? Relative to your situation, it's just what you, it's what it is, but you didn't know there's an easier version if there was. And, and also when you come in, you also don't know what's impossible. And sometimes your unrealistic expectations can actually help you find some things that no one, you know, why, why does this happen? You, you can question basic things. Like, yeah. um, as I you know, said to a lot of you, why does all, in the beginning, why does our, why does, why are people sending us fish that already cut? We can cut fish. We have knives. Yeah. And um, figuring out that, gosh, if I could get the fish whole. And why does everybody put all your fish in a fish case? Why aren't we storing it buried in ice so that it, I mean, we, we literally just uh, took, we took, the supply chain was so challenging and uh, I just, nothing was sacred. I was like, 
there's no aspect of this that cannot yeah. be questioned. Oh, I can't help but think of uh, the, my interview with Nick Kakanis from mm -hmm. uh, Linear Restaurant Group, right? He has zero experience in the restaurant industry, was but like he was some kind of like mathematician, like dividends trader or something like that, like math genius. He came into the industry and he was just like with like a clean slate, right? And he's like, why are we doing it this way? Like there's so many, like I can see so many more efficiencies, but uh, when you come up in the industry and somebody teaches you, you pick up a lot of the bad habits, right? I think, um, so uh, the food industry, food is the second oldest thing that humans have bartered or sold. I'll let you figure out what the first one probably was. <laughs> we There's some real, um, we are so set in our ways as humans about food. There's so many counterintuitive things about the food industry. And if you just grew up in the industry, that's the way we've always done it. Yeah. Versus, you know, the first person, you know, I'm going to give an example here. Um, we always laugh that, uh, so we have our self-serve kiosk in Malibu Poke. Oh, we're going to get into that. And we're going to Here, I, and, you know, it, the people are saying, I need to tell a server my order. I would never order on an iPad. That server writes it down on a green piece of paper, walks five steps, Puts and it enters into an iPad, <laughs> yeah. right? But humans kind of want things the way yeah. they want them. So there's so many counterintuitive things about the food industry. And um, I think not being from it and having like no, not growing up in the food business gave me this really unique perspective of just question yeah. everything. Yeah. And so by the way, I learned why the, it had been done one way more often than figuring out that I had a better idea. The, oh, that's why it's done that way. Ah, changing it and seeing, oh, let's go back to the old way. Yeah, I like that. I like the humility, the humility there. So we're going to take one, more, uh, one quick break. We'll be right back to kind of dive into some of the biggest challenges you had, uh, some of the biggest successes you had, and I'm really looking to unpackage this. And then we're going to start talking about Malibu. Cool. So, all right, we'll be right back. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. All right, we're back. And really, this is where I'm just going to let you kind of like freestyle, man. So from like early 2010s to present time, uh, before opening Malibu, reflecting back at that time, what were some of the biggest lessons you learned that you can kind of, by sharing with us, you can alleviate maybe one of our listeners from making the same mistakes or maybe some of the, the big su successes you had? Um, you know, uh, I'd say the in growing, first of all, um, I think the way that suddenly Yelp came out and it was the, the feedback became instant. Yeah. And if you, uh, certain types end up in the food business, people pleasers, we want everybody to be happy. Yeah. We're just throwing a part. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Just don't even, just, just make like people me. happy. Yeah. Just, just like me and give yeah. me that affirmation. Yeah. And like everybody else, um, I, I, I took it the opposite way as opposed to people are like F yell, blah, blah, blah. I can't believe it. how dare they. And so I would lose sleep over, you know, somebody and, it was the untrue ones that bothered me. If somebody said, hey, I got this and it wasn't exactly the way it should have been, and I was like, you know what, you're right. Man, I could fix that. But when somebody would walk in and just didn't get the experience that, the vision I had in my head, and oh my gosh, you didn't get that experience, I mean, I would, I would lose sleep over it. It yeah. would make me nuts. And um, so that learning how to be a people pleaser in a people pleasing business, but not lose a pound of, you know, not have a heart attack. Not over, taking it so personally. If you're scared to fail, you'll fail more. Being okay with failure makes you fail less. You know, God, those NBA players who yeah, yeah, miss three shots in a row, give me the, give me the ball. Yeah. Right? And, <laughs> and the guy who's freaking out that he missed a shot just can't get past it. Now you have performance anxiety, right? Yeah. Um, so um, going from being a retail business in a neighborhood where everybody knew my family and yeah. Noah, to opening restaurants and now there's strangers who I didn't have that cushion of, oh, how's your mom? Versus... I walk in, I'm spending my money, this is either good or it's not. And um, learning, kind of getting out of that safety net of that kind of neighborhood family business into, we don't care who your family is, <laughs> I just paid good money for this yeah, food, is it good or not? Experience. Yeah, right. so I guess what is the failure here? Were you letting yourself get too attached Without to it? Without a doubt, I was, uh, in the very beginning, I could not function without what I perceived as a perfect service every time. What would happen? To, like, would you be debilitated? Like, what would go on when, once you got one of these bad reviews or something? I took it home. It yeah. was, it, it was, I, I never could, I was never not working because I was sitting around worrying about every experience. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, and that was, that was hard. Um, uh, as we grew that first, we opened our, we initially, so you asked, in two, we, uh, after 2000, we started to look for 
I want to change our neighborhood fish market into a combination fish market restaurant. Did you guys just expand off of that location? Was it this so location here? So initially, we started looking for locations to just move, to go from transitioning from I'm a neighborhood fish market to a combination fish market restaurant. Okay. Instead, we found a perfect piece of property too far away to move. So we ended up with a neighborhood fish market and a combination fish market restaurant four miles from each other. Is that this location? Uh, no, this was uh, so this south. So this is your second location. Yeah. Gotcha. So this is the original neighborhood, but it replaced the original fish market. Okay. And um, so I went from, okay, now how, how do I learn the restaurant business, but also how do I manage two units at the same time? And oh, by the way, these two units have the same brand, the same products, but two different business models and, sh- sh- and an overlap of customers. Um, it was confusing. It was, You're still talking about TJ's, not Yes, this is TJ's. Right. This is all TJ's. Um, that was confusing. The, anytime you're in that transition, you know, we all tend to think, okay, here's where I am and what I want to do next. And you imagine it as flipping a switch, but there's usually some sort of messy transitional yeah. period yeah. in the middle. So we had a very confusing business model of people showing up at one place. I thought this was a, I thought this was a restaurant. No, you're at our fish market. You want to go down the road. I mean, it was, um, I had this vision, but literally you couldn't build it fast literally could not be built fast enough and you know I, uh and that was that was that was hard how much I, time elapsed between opening the first or, or transitioning the first location to opening the second location a year and a half a year and a half yeah. okay so that's pretty it's i mean that's a short amount of time to open two places and learn the industry in the process yes so <laughs> would you have done it the same way if it, looking back or would you have maybe scaled a little slower or i mean you won awards pretty soon after so you're doing something right yeah um I, I I don't know. Um, I am I I have no sense of time. Um, when I'm, I literally have to like write down when all these dates were. I have no sense of time. Every day is today. Yeah. And I kind of look. Uh, so, I uh, I don't really think in terms of timelines. I think in terms of to do lists. And when that to do list is done, that's how long it took. <laughs> and so I didn't. I just kind of knew what I all wanted it to be and how long. It's not like I said in you know. Um, my wife's more the planner, right? We're going to have our first baby here, and then we want the next kid to be this many, you know, and the, it, the to go to the same school at the same time, so we have the next baby here. I, I'm just not that guy. It's yeah. like I wake up and, oh, you that's You just show how up when it it's time to make the baby. I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious. Um, I want to make sure I identified this right. Um, you, your challenge was uh, not having a clear vision of what the concept was going to be or the transitional point between changing what the vision was to what it was going to be. The most valuable thing that my business had was our, at the time, 20 year relationship with our customers. I wanted to change what we brought to those customers. And it was really challenging for a couple years in changing who we were, but having this strange uh, teenage awkward stage where we literally, I wanted to take our business from being a fish market to being restaurants. And at one point, we literally had a fish market in one neighborhood, a restaurant in the other. And it was just really, what one, I have two restaurants, I mean, two businesses four miles from each other. You'd think you'd have economies of scale, but they were like two different businesses, um, but serving the same product and the same customer base. It was, uh, it was the literal brick and mortar didn't quite reflect yet what the, um, didn't quite reflect yet what my vision was. Okay. So how did you transition to get, I mean, would you say you have what your vision, what, what the business is today? Was that the vision? that you originally had? Yes. So the, how, how did you make that, that transition? How did you get it to where you wanted it to be? Um, I will say there was some trial and error. You know, it's interesting from being, re- what, what people look for from a retail environment, which is what a fish market is, and what people look for from a restaurant are two totally different things. And what we had to find is, what do people like about us from a retail, and how does that translate to being a restaurant? So some person might say, you have the absolute best fish in town. Um, but then the, they would, they weren't look, but for a restaurant, they might want a shrimp po' boy. They weren't looking for a $36 best fish in town entree. Yeah. We were laughing. We sold everything from caviar to catfish. <laughs> That's a strange restaurant. Nobody opens a restaurant saying we're going to serve everything from caviar to catfish. That's a bizarre business model. So how we took kind of what we do as a fish market and cherry pick the best aspects of it to be a really good restaurant. I would become obsessive of everything. The fish case has to be on the menu. It was it was like more almost like an OCD thing. Yeah. Like it was uneven to me if we had a fish in there and it wasn't on the menu. And then it's, so what was the catch of the day and how could it rotate and um, uh, all things the guests didn't care about that were like these internal. Um, I just 
putting the puzzle pieces together was so complicated to me. Yeah. Um, it was and and compl- all for what? All for what? Yeah. The guest just wanted to sit down and order good food. So you did you shed that mentality of, of having it took everything me to bounce? Probably. Uh, so TJ's Oaklawn. Um, uh, in retrospect, I'm proud of this, but it took us originally. Our vision was you walked up to the fish counter and ordered. I thought that made it more casual. I thought that it you could. I'm the kind. I'm a. I want to see my food. I want to see it looking back at yeah. any point. We then kind of got pushback of I'm not paying x number of dollars for a dish that i have to stand up here and order and so then we quickly pivoted to servers and then with servers i you know we it we at that point we were still operating like it was a fish market of pick this pick this pick this you could kind of we called it choose your own adventure kind of uh seafood ordering and then we found that if you weren't looking at the fish case you yeah. didn't want to make so many options and choices it yeah. wasn't as intuitive you people just wanted the ser- just wanted do the options thinking for them, do the right? thinking for them yeah so um the end result was everybody just kind of wanted it to be a normal restaurant. And I had to find, as opposed to completely changing how you would come and order seafood, I had to find two or three aspects of our retail environment that differentiated us from every other place. Focus on those and not worry about the 20 other that were distracting. Okay. Say that one more time. I just want to make sure I, I picked up on it and my listeners picked up on gotcha. it. Gotcha. Um, we really wanted to be a different kind of experience. I really wanted to take what made us different as a retail fish market and translate that to a restaurant. Okay. There were about 20 different ways that that was different. And it took us to find the three right ones, right? Or the handful of things that made us different and focus on those and stop worrying about 20 distractions. Yeah, it's the, the mentality of doing a few things the best. Yes. And not trying to be everything to everybody. So what were the three things you narrowed down? So number one is we found that um, people love, uh, not everybody wants a complicated um, preparation with seafood. Um, a lot of people feel as though a great fresh piece of fish should be, you know, should be the star of the plate. And we, um, so what we found is we, we were concerned that people, you know, as Instagram and everything was chefier and chefier and chefier and, uh, you know, molecular was all the rage. And then we just felt like um, we felt like one of the things we did find was giving people that same ability to order just a f- we call it. It's not chef driven. It's fish driven. Yeah. All right. The fish is the star of the plate, yeah. not the chef or whatever. It's- so giving people the ability to see the fish case, they don't have to order from there, but know that I can get anything and any piece of fish simply grilled with two sides. Um, was a really big aspect. Um, they, we, they didn't want to order it from the counter, but they wanted to know that it was there. Um, another aspect that was different was utilizing the different um, the different parts of the fish. We kind of, you know, like Native American, the whole buffalo thing. Yeah. And in a fish market, generates lots of, you know, w- weird parts of fish. Yeah. Utilizing that on the menu, whether it's a fish collar, whether that's smoked salmon bellies, whether that is cheeks, fish whether broth. that's... Yeah. Um, is that something that you do, like a soup or something with the fish broth or the bones or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, making stocks. Yeah. Um, we you take advantage. Um, most restaurants are buying pre-cut fillets of fish and they throw it on your plate. We're generating all these interesting things, like utilizing it. And so the two things I've got so far, just make sure um, I'm on track with you. First, keeping it simple, uh, just keeping the fish, fre- like focusing on the freshness of the fish. Um, I say giving people the option. Okay. Some people want that chefy preparation, and that's what they're looking for. Some people um, and just so, want a good cut. So originally, it was pick your fish. You will grill it. It'll be very simple. And then when we transitioned to, uh, to wait staff. We then thought, oh, now we have servers. Everything has to be a composed dish. Yeah. And then we kind of found the middle ground of being able, you know. Okay. Uh, so that was number one. Give them the option. The second thing was use, utilizing the entire fish, using everything, the byproduct. Yeah. Um, we found that we have cuts of seafood that other places don't have because we are butchering fish in a fish market. Yeah. Giving people unique options uh, on the menu. Like most places if you see a fish collar on the menu they ordered that fish collar like we have all this stuff where yeah. it's, it's like you know um so uh we uh utilizing the different whole, whole fish and also and profiting off the whole fish yes yeah so that's um, the other big aspect we always like la- profiting how about cutting your losses yeah. look you, um red snapper is 17 18 99 a pound right I now feel you. yeah okay an ounce a two of waste of red snapper ends up in the gumbo great 
but you also just put seventeen dollar fish in a soup <laughs> that you're charging whatever for, right? So, so what's the third thing? <laughs> um, the third thing that we found in transitioning from retail to restaurant and kind of finding that middle ground was um, communication and education. You training our service staff to speak intelligently about seafood the same way we trained our counter staff. We thought somebody walks into the fish counter, they're going to have questions and they need answers. Mm -hmm. Is this wild card? Is this responsibly farmed? What does responsibly farmed mean? Is farm raised fish bad? Um, my doctor, my husband's uh, cardiologist tells him to eat more omega 3s. Which of these fish have more omega 3s? Um, how would I prepare this fish? How would I prepare this fish, et cetera, right? I feel like most times you go to a seafood restaurant, you don't really get that educational aspect at the table. Mm. So, how we take that information, what of that is interesting to a dining room guests and we didn't want to turn into a lecture series but we tell our servers you are a seafood expert you are representing our you you need to be able to give them find one or two points in your interaction where you can educate them a little about yeah. seafood not in a, not in a, not in a condescending in a so that they enjoy their meal more because they know the nutrients that are in it or they know where the fish came from. So that's huge. That The, the value of educating your staff is huge. Um, it, it adds the experience for your guests, right? They now, they're tying this meal with an, a new piece of knowledge that they're, you know, whenever they have that meal again, they're going to remember this knowledge that they learned at your restaurant, at TJ's. Um, it really uh, has a huge impact. And if there's not a why to it, then it was, a, then why, no, it, explaining a why it's not just again not juggling we're not just um, go we we kind of use wine wine is a good example right um if there's not a why to the wine description um hi tell me about this chardonnay well you know some people like light and crisp chardonnay some people like buttery gnocchi chardonnays this one's buttery gnocchi okay there's a why yeah. you just told me what i'm like the it comes from 90 year old vines on a 45 degree slope and the malactic fermentation well you lost them and they don't understand what am I gonna like this wine if I spend sixteen dollars on this glass of wine am I going is it gonna make my mouth happy yeah that's the why yeah right so how do you get your people I mean educating your staff is not cheap it's a process it takes months if not years to get uh, somebody fully educated on a, a genre of cuisine right so what do you, what, what systems do you implement to educate your team um, number one, uh, again, this comes from my political background, is uh, we simplify it. I literally, um, we, we've had managers who are psalms, and I, I, will, I will take the tech sheets away. There's, yeah, that is a distraction. Give them the right three-word answer, mm. right? We, we, are ve we edit the information we give, and then we hold our staff accountable to knowing that information. Our job is to make it manageable. What form do you give it to them? So um, people learn different ways, and we give them the same information multiple ways. Um, first is we talk about it. Second is we give them a written manual. Third, we'll have a written test. Because some people like uh, um, some people need to write the answer down for it to print in their brain. Yeah. Then we'll role play. Um, and we actually do it verbally. So at that point, um, uh, you all heard the classic marketing best practice takes three impressions to make a marketing yeah. thing. Somebody has to hear information three times, sometimes in different ways for it to stick. Yeah. So where are you, how do your, your team members access? Is this a packet they get? Can yes. they do it online? Okay, cool. Um, any advice for, any other advice we're missing regarding training up your staff? Anything that's helpful that is, has worked for you that you can drop on my listeners now? I think that if, uh, if the staff, under, again, if the staff understands why, it's not a test, what is the capital of... Yeah, Iowa. Actually, yeah. I don't know. I memorized that at one point. Couldn't tell you. <laughs> Des Moines? I don't know. Um, uh, prostate, sure. Right. Sure. I'll go with it. Why? Right? Why are we learning this? So as we say, we kind of, um, we don't just teach the information. We teach the frequently asked question. If somebody is asking about this, this is the kind of information they're looking for. Some people... Um, uh, will ask uh, some people ask the wrong question. We will train. This is what they're really asking you. Uh, Here's something in our our fish tacos are spicy, right? Here's what we a little training method we do. Uh, it's on our test, on our written test. When someone asks you, "Are the fish tacos spicy?" What are they really telling you? I don't like spicy. I food. don't like spicy food. <laughs> yeah. So then your answer is now is from from a place of servitude. Okay, the book answer may be it on the what is the spicy scale? It is a two point whatever, right? Yeah. The real answer is, if you don't like spicy, I wouldn't order them. Yeah. 
right? It, it's, it's, I got it's, you. It's the why of what we're doing. The other thing we do is make it. E- my, I always say a restaurant owner's job is to make his staff's job easier, as opposed to making our staff memorize the full flavoredness or mildness of every fish. We arrange the fish in the fish case from mildest to most full flavored. Then we put a sign in with an arrow that says the mild side and the full flavored side. And so, as a, again, there's some, these guys, don't, don't ask them to memorize all that. Give them, make their job easier by organizing the information in many different ways so it's easier for the guests. You gotta give your people the tools, both the guests and the employees, the tools to make the experience as, joy, as enjoyable as possible. Put your wine list from yeah. the lightest to the fullest, right? Yeah. Like, get, make if it you simple, stupid. Organize information. People are, um, the people who have those crazy memorization, like they can memorize an entire deck of cards or stuff, yeah. it's that what they actually have is systems yeah. for organizing that information. Whether it's an acronym or whatever it is, yeah. you know, uh, word, asso- word association, whatever it is. I got you. So um, anything else worth talking about regarding TJ's? Uh, I feel like we probably left a lot out, but we got to make sure we leave some time for Malibu Pokey. Um, uh, in general, I'm, I am the luckiest guy on earth. Um, I had a business that my parents had that had room to grow, but also had 20 years of brand equity and customer loyalty. And I will just say that um, everybody wants to be, you know, you're pitching investors on the next big yeah. hip restaurant. I will tell you, when we went to investors to build this restaurant, I told them, if you're looking to invest in the next hottest restaurant in town, I ain't your guy. If you would like to be part of something that hopefully your kids you can bring your kids here and maybe your grandkids can be a hostess here. I think that in our effort to, with TJ's, uh, we really wanted to be that place that will be here for 30 years. Yeah. And I don't even know if anybody wants to build those restaurants anymore. Right. It's, uh, it, it, we've kind of, that used to be something that people, you know, those long standing deep roots in a neighborhood. Um, that was what we envisioned for TJ's. And so far we are still, uh, our 30th year was our most successful year. Beautiful. I love it. Congratulations, by the way. That's great. So when, at what point did this vision for Malibu Pokey start bubbling up inside you? Malibu Pokey was a fun story. Um, so my wife and I went on our baby moon. We we're in Santa Barbara. We flew to LAX and you drive through Santa Monica on the way yep. to Santa Barbara. Um, as I frequently do with my wife is I try to turn our vacations into seafood research and development trips. <laughs> oh my God, John, how many stinky fish markets are you going to take me to on this trip? Um, I said, please, there's kind of a new thing in Santa Monica. What year is it now? I know you don't do time well. I, yeah, uh, 2015, 2000? Something like that, 16 maybe? Yep. And I said, I'm kind of reading about this thing, and, and obviously I'm familiar with Hawaiian poke, but it seems to be kind of catching on, and, and uh, can we just go eat at this restaurant on the way home from the airport? And um, I ate at a couple of the poke places in Santa Monica, and I said, holy mackerel, this is, I, I love this food. Um, uh, I love how I feel after eating it. It checks every box of what the new generation of diners are looking for. It's customizable. It's Instagrammable. It's um, it's healthy. It's easily delivered. It's everything they're yeah. looking for, and it's seafood. Yeah. And so um, I said, after doing eating that in California, and I want to be very clear. Um, I'm sure cultural appropriation and those conversations have come up on your podcast before. Yeah. Um, Hawaiian poke is a beautiful dish native to Hawaii, and it is something that's significant in their culture. There's a Southern California bastardization of it, <laughs> of which was really our inspiration. Okay. So we were, um, we always laugh in Texas, you'll never go broke uh, selling what's hot in California <laughs> next, we- next week to Texas, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just thought that the Southern California style of what they were doing with Hawaiian poke was just a really beautiful thing. Um, so uh, I come back to Texas, I grab our chef partner, we get on a plane, we go back to LA, and I'm like, hey, I want you to look at this and tell me if I'm crazy or that I think that we could really do this in Dallas. This is Matt McAllister, right? Uh, this is not no. Matt. This is my internal. Matt did the menu for Malibu. I actually have a partner in gotcha, our gotcha. parent company. Yeah. We are driving around. We, we, we kind of put all our notes together. We're like, holy mackerel, we're going to take, we're, we can do this in Dallas, and I think there's some do Is that twist. holy mackerel? I, I've said it twice, and um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Okay, um, sorry, I had to ask. Keep going. No, um, I will tell people I have bigger fish to fry uh. than this particular thing. <laughs> that that one's intentional. Yeah, I dig it. Um, as I'm coming back and I land in Dallas, my buddy who I went to 
middle school with, who lives in L.A., calls me. He says, John, are you familiar with Poke? Because it's all the rage here in L.A., and I think we, sh- we should do it in Dallas, and you're the guy. And I was like, did, did you, I was like, I almost called you, you while me? I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah. is this a joke? Like, yeah. did you, like, I almost called you when I was That's in crazy. town. Um, so it was a real kismet kind of thing. And what we, f- I, I had a thesis, and the thesis turned out to be right. Poke became the cupcakes of that year, right? It was the food trend. And for whatever reason, our food culture today, I would say hipsters can elevate anything. You want to go find a $12 grilled cheese? Let's go find a $12 grilled cheese, right? It's, um, for whatever reason, poke, I, I saw it. I ate at really good poke in L.A., and I thought I was going to eat 12 amazing poke places. I ate like one or two good poke places and a bunch of crap. Mm. It had already happened in like six months. And I had a feeling that poke was going to, and it was, a race to the bottom in terms of price and qual- uh, uh, quality and price, and it became this like, who can serve the cheapest poke bowl? And I said, wait a minute. Our diners in America have shown they will pay money to have better ingredients, to have something that is an elevated experience. And I said, why of all things, where we're so in, in, uh, so interested in ingredients, poke is a bowl, a bowl of raw ingredients. Why shouldn't it be the best damn Raw ingredients you can find, and I know somebody will pay for that. Yeah. And so what we decided is everybody is zigging to go cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. Yeah. cheaper. What if we say, wait a minute, because I looked around, nobody was serving poke with fish that we would put in our fish markets or serve in our in our award winning TJ's restaurants. Yeah. We're good. So, it's still there. <laughs> or tremors here at uh, <laughs> Dallas, Texas. Um, what if we? serve the kind of product that we serve and that people already know that they like the same thing as I said nobody walks in the butcher and says is this ribeye really fresh somebody could walk into a poke place and say I don't have to worry is this going to kill me mm. because I trust the TJ's brand, yeah. I know these guys yeah uh, yeah. so how yeah. did well you didn't you're not tying the brand so people do people know that you were associated with TJ's um, yeah, yeah uh, we um, so we didn't want to literally brand them together we wanted them to be separate concepts but Again, people are, I'm still fascinated that people read food blogs and, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people knew, people walk in yeah. like, oh, this is, I mean, Associated people, with, yeah. it was, it was an easy story to tell. And so what I, I said is what we wanted to do was differentiate ourselves from every other poke place. So we built out the restaurants with a really cute interior, got award-winning designers to make it really, I always said, I didn't want, um, and you know, if you took your, if you took your date there, they didn't feel like they got taken to Arby's, right? <laughs> yeah. um, where everybody else was using um, plastic bowls, we used real bowls with a rose gold fork and we put it on a little branded tray. And we just wanted to, from the time you walked in the door, for your shoulders to drop and you say, oh, I can relax. Yeah. This isn't going to kill me. Okay. And um, we, it was really fun because TJ's was this thing that it existed and I had this, th- this was my first experience of creating a concept from scratch. Clean slate. And yeah. we just really wanted to be very cohesive. Everything from the brand to the finish up, everything gave you this relaxation of, I can trust these people. Yeah. So, so you opened the first location when? For the, the first Malibu? Fall of what are we now? Twenty no, no, fall of eighteen. Fall so of it se- took you fall about a year from when fall you, of seventeen. So so was, was it about a year, six months from when you had the idea to actually be doors open? How long did that process take? Um, and I I told you don't trust me on yeah, dates. Get, uh, like ballpark. Uh, I think maybe it was fifteen when I went there. It probably was literally the longest portion of it was getting a lease signed. I'm okay. sure every restaurant tour has the same story of getting literally from finding the location you want. To telling them I will pay your money to getting, to the permits getting and, yeah. it all that that was the longest process that was okay. like six months right any now. lessons that you learned like did, did, did that process get held up for it did you could you have done anything better to speed up that process we literally but we we went above the asking price <laughs> to overbid to do faster um, at one point we even had another um, operator who we found out after we had hired attorneys and were moving forward with the lease who had a right reverse refusal on the space that he didn't even know he had I mean it was a comedy of errors oh my gosh of, we literally it was the take my money me yeah. right like yeah. here and I'm sure you're trying to rush because you know this is like one of those things where it's going to be first to market right like you're bringing this so it's, it's we, before the, the huge pokey craze it hadn't quite gotten to in Dallas in fact yet. we missed being first to market okay. and we stressed out over it and you know it was great it was wonderful because we weren't just telling people what we weren't ex- people had context now instead of 
this is the best poker you're ever going to have and you're going to have to trust me because you never had any other one versus they'd had it a couple other places and, and now, they, now they were like, oh, okay, I yeah. taste the difference. Yeah. I see. Um, <laughs> so it was actually, uh, couldn't have worked out better. I was nice. glad we weren't first market. So looking back at this experience with Malibu Pokey, um, any hard lessons? Any challenges? Yes. Um, so uh, when we opened Malibu Poke, uh, we had we had uh, it w- we had no non seafood options. It was we had were very limited in our sizes. It was um, because TJs we try to be everything to everybody as they were catfish to caviar and yeah. we're one person special occasion restaurant or another person three times a week uh, yeah. in sweaty yoga pants right. Malibu Poke we tried to draw a tighter box around it, be very limited in what we were doing. And I learned that no matter what format, you're still in the hospitality business. Yeah. You're still in the making people happy business. You know what? Wish I'd had chicken bowls on the first day we opened. I didn't think we needed them. You know, mm. we needed chicken bowls, right? Um, we, uh, we do like poke tacos. I said, we don't need to distract with blah, 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 blah. No. We need to give people, um, in general, you're, no matter what you're doing, whether it's a QSR or a big full service restaurant, you're still in the hospitality business and not everybody wants the same thing. Were you not being hospita- hosp- hospitable early on, or were, were there instances where you, you got I, heat? Uh, no, I think that we just had a tighter tighter box around our offerings. We were very limited in what we were offering, and we, by, by expanding our uh, offerings um, to stuff like chicken bowls or vegan, we, we created, uh, we found that, oh my gosh, um, there was no way to order a bowl without fish. And people were coming in and saying, I'm vegan. You have all this fresh farm produce. You have these amazing sauces. This would be my vegan restaurant. I, there's no way to order a bowl without fish. <laughs> Duh. How did I not think about that from yeah. day one? Like, uh, I feel you. So we created a build-your-own vegan bowl menu, right? And Well, I mean, back to what you were saying earlier, just listening, paying attention to what people are saying. They'll tell you exactly what they want and, like, and look for the trends. Don't say yes to everything that people write, but if the same thing keeps coming up, more vegan options, more vegan options, more vegan options. Well, that's your that's your cue. That's your hint. Our thing is we had vegan options. We didn't know how to put them tell, together. We didn't know how to put them together. Yeah. It was, the puzzle pieces were sitting right in front of us. Yeah, you said it. So, um, just as you said, listening... Uh, no, people don't stay on ceremony anymore. They're going to tell you exactly what they want. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, separating the, the radio from the static, the signal from the static. Um, you know, every restaurant, uh, the single most common complaint of every restaurant at every price level is too expensive. Yeah. Well, right? I mean, that, that, you're always going to find that person. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're, 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 um, they're hard to avoid. But if you ignore every price complaint, then you are not hearing people giving you constructive feedback on value, which is very different than price. Mm. And so we kind of found like, hey, if you, we found Malibu Poke, we were bringing in the same sashimi grade fish you get at the best sushi restaurants. We were making kushikari grain sushi rice, like real, like (laughs) Michelin star sushi restaurants, right? We were blending our own seaweed salad with four species of wild seaweed. Every sauce is made from scratch. Everything was, we were, we were taking fine dining quality. We, we were really calling it fast fine. Mm. Quick serve restaurant serving fine dining quality food, but in a quick serve environment. And um, so that is not cheap. No. So if somebody didn't, if somebody got, a, if we got a, a Yelp review and it said, uh, the large has more, has more, the large is bigger over at ABC Poke Company. That's not our customer. Yeah. That we, we, we're not for them. I mean, that's fine. Um, for somebody who said, hey, I really like this place. I didn't feel like I got enough mango. Okay, that's somebody, that was, that's, that's feedback I want to hear. Um, we, you know, we, so it was really, I, I learned to better separate out the, cons- the useful feedback from the- Obscure. It, well, because <laughs> people tend to be very binary. Yeah. I listen to my customers or I ignore it. No, there's actually, 10% of the feedback is the 90% most powerful of it, you yeah, know? Yeah. Finding what that's that 80-20 is. rule, right? Yeah, uh, that yeah. would have, I was, yeah. should have said 80-20, you know. No, yeah. I'm picking up what you're putting down. So one thing I we need to discuss and something I'm really curious about is you you tried to you you tied in heavy technology with this Malibu Pokey. What was your thought process behind that? So one is I believe in um, I said it earlier that um, restaurants are counterintuitive. We all Sometimes there's this, there's this binary question of, do I want my restaurant to be hospitality driven or do I want my restaurant to be tech driven? 
and I reject that as it can't a. Can't be both, right? Why not? It absolutely can well, be. That's both. what I'm saying. It. How do you use tech to give better hospitality? How do you use tech to give better hospitality? Well, I'll tell you how we did it in Malibu Poke, right? So number one is we, um, I found that most of these self-serve kiosks to me felt like a, a bad experience. It felt like you just put this in front of me so you didn't have to pay a cashier. So the number one is we drew some really, uh, some lines. We said if a self-serve kiosk experience was not overwhelmingly better than talking to a person we weren't interested in it if it was not a better experience think about that for a second in that when you you know is doing your own gas better than getting it done for you uh, I, I don't know that it is you know like if going to the atm better than going to a teller if we said it's not better then i wasn't interested in it so we didn't stop tweaking the system until we overwhelmingly believed it was 100% better than talking to a cashier. So what, when did you know you got it to that point? Like what made it so feedback. much better? Customer feedback. Absolute. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I was a uh, yeah. restaurant operator. Uh, I was watching a customer and uh, uh, got distracted. Uh, no, I was, sorry about that. I was, it was funny. When I was, sitting, when I was setting this up, I was like, which, whenever I set up an interview, I'm always trying to figure out which angle will be less distracting for the owner gotcha. and i figured the Weird. kitchen and everything was that way but i my my family <laughs> won't eat meat with me at, at any of our restaurants because i'm just watching, no, you're, you're doing watching. Great. Um, so what, sorry so um so l- l- paint l- that picture of the end product okay. what it looked like so, 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 so let me tell you the metrics number one um speed four self-serve kiosks reduce the queue time we literally you can get in our restaurant get through the line order your food faster that's number one way it makes it better number two um, the ability to um, give people a visualization of crazy, weird ingredients. We have some ingredients you've never heard of. Um, as opposed to a cashier having to memorize what they are and to describe them, there's a picture. What is for a kake? Oh, it's Japanese rice seasoning, right? What is a rario? Oh, that's a little glutinous rice ball. Um, by showing people pictures, they could wrap their head around what it was. Number three is um, consistency and not uh, making mistakes. When people, if we could make the self-serve kiosk environment so that we had less comps. I said I wanted no red onion. That cashier wasn't listening to me, right? If we could improve the, hey, this isn't made right, this isn't what I ordered, then we were doing it right. If the system was confusing people and they were screwing up their orders, then it wasn't right. Yeah. Um, Last thing is um, the order history. The ability for people to remember their orders and um, access them with one click of a button on next visits. Malibu Poke is very much about deep, deep customer loyalty. Um, we're not for everybody, but the people we're for um, come three times a week. Yeah. You ever heard the old Jerry Garcia? Yeah. Not uh, it, Grateful Dead's like licorice. Not everybody likes licorice, but people like licorice really like licorice. Yeah. So uh, you know, I mean, it's that same thing. Of it's, we're not for everybody, but man, those people love us. Really, really love us. So just real again, uh, the the four filters you put through to make sure that this technology would be more hospitable. You identified that it would be faster, uh, more visual, more visualization. Uh, which would help with the questions that your guests would have, right. uh, consistency, and then order history. So how fast does it take now? Like, uh, so now a guest, um, the, um, so we have incredible metrics on this. The average guest places their order in less than a minute and 20 seconds. Their food comes out in less than six minutes. So, um, the, so somebody can walk into our restaurant and because of this technology, get a James Beard nominated Poke chef, Bowl, yeah. mo- Poke Bowl, <laughs> in seven and a half minutes. That's pretty awesome. That's, and that is what we, and, and not feel as though they were sent through some sort of weird faceless conveyor belt. You said that was the average time for the, what if you have somebody who is a regular who comes three times a week who already has their, their meal designed and they walk up, because you have facial recognition, which I'm sure it ties into walk the consistency in, in the order history, right? You can walk in, smile for the camera, it sees you, it'll pull up your orders, hit click. How you, long does that take? I mean, it can take 30 seconds. That's awesome. It's, it is, we're living in the future. It's, yeah. it's awesome. So has this cut down on costs? Because yeah, um, you have less mistakes, theoretically. Uh, uh, I think You're not paying somebody, right? So no. Um, so one of the things we found is technology is great, but people still want the reassurance of a human. So yeah. we pay, so 
where it saves us money is not that we don't have to have a cashier. It's that I can have one, what I call my Poke Pro, ready to give human answers to questions, yeah. oversee four kiosks. So as a customer, it's a high-touch customer service. It's like having that that floater, like in the, in the fast casual. You don't need to have that floater there, but you need that person there to touch tables, to ask questions. Is that the same thing, but with the Abs- ordering process? Absolutely. Um, we laugh. There is, um, we'll, we'll, you'll see somebody walk in Malibu Poke staring at their, staring at their phone. And then they'll put, take their phone down and say, oh, wait, what? I'm not ordering, I'm not ordering my food on a screen. <laughs> and I, one time I asked somebody, well, do you mind me asking, man? Like, what were you doing on your phone? She's like, I was buying a plane ticket. I was like, <laughs> then I know. They, and, and we both laughed. And I mean, I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck, but I was like, we both laughed. And she's like, oh, yeah. Like, it was like the irony of the well, situation. Well, I think what you're explaining is something that all first adopters experience and you're kind of for, I mean, you've been using these kiosks now for two years. So I mean, two, three years ago is that that's when these, these conversations of kiosks are really starting to rev up. Right. And you're an early adopter. So you're going to have that resistance. I mean, I think it will pay off in the long run. Do you think, is that kind of your, has it already started? Have you seen less resistance? Without a doubt. We, yeah. uh, number one is, um, it's a, it's a really cool differentiation. I will see a customer come in and be apprehensive about the screen on day one. I'll see them a week later come in, bring their friends. This is that place with those cool screens. This is so fun. Watch how we do it. So it's a unique selling proposition. Yeah, it is. It's a. um, The other thing is, uh, we bought the Ferrari of self serve kiosks. I pay. What is the Ferrari of self serve um, kiosks? uh, In your opinion, uh, they. we we use a company. Um, I, I, I don't want to answer that directly because they were the Ferrari two or three years ago. Okay. I don't know exactly. There may be a new Ferrari. There may be the the new Lamborghini out. I now. got you. Um, we uh, but for our self serve kiosks, what we found at the time we bought the best money could buy, and um, what I think that as I said, most of the self serve kiosks, I feel like the they're just trying to you know it's like the self serve line at the grocery store. Just a, you're just trying to get me through here faster and make me do the work you were paying somebody to yeah. do. When we had this really beautiful interface um, with beautiful, I mean, we spent thousands of dollars in just food photography for pictures on the kiosk. Yeah. Seasonal bowl, new ingredients. I got to do a photo shoot yeah. just to put them on the kiosk. It's not. It's not just a plug and play. We put a lot of work into those kiosks. User experience. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're just trying to trim your budget, it'll show. If it's just if it's something that is improving the guest experience, and you're, then then it's great. Would you say you're about breaking even then with yeah, having these? Okay. I would say that um, it frees up. Um, well, let's put it this way: as if, if I can have one cashier oversee four kiosks, I can take that labor dollars and put it to a line cook to make bowls faster to feed the four kiosks. <laughs> yeah, right. I feel so it's more of a, reappor- a reapportioning of the budget versus just. Seeing it directly okay. to the bottom line. I'm curious. Um, you did identify that you knew that that pokey was going to be a trend. Um, has where is that trend? Has it come and gone? Did you? So the um, the question, you know, fad versus trend, right? Um, our cons- we we believed that it would have staying power. What we believed our thesis was that good food is never a fad. We, if we make great food. And we deliver it, not literally delivered, if we give it to the guest in the form of poke, yeah. and it's always great food, we're, we're not going to ride the trend. Yeah. Um, so we knew it would have staying power. What we predicted, and we've already seen, is the junky, race to the bottom, uh, not quality driven poke places would be like the Froyo places. Yeah, they would be go. gone, yeah. and, and you're already seeing that. I mean, yeah. You're seeing poke places close, close left and right. But what about your numbers? Have you have you uh, been able to sustain are, or grow? We are growing. We are one nice. of the handful of uh, growing poke concepts in the country. Beautiful. I'm glad to hear that. So you you are very system driven. You are very technology driven. Any other technologies that you're leveraging? Maybe more recently. Uh, to I will tell you, Slack changed my nice. restaurant world. Nice. All of my nine to five rest uh, buddies were like, you still like email your coworker like. You don't slack. What's <laughs> and for you know when I left corporate America and I left the, the office world and went to restaurants, what I considered office best practices were what I remembered. Ten years later, I was so freaking behind the times, <laughs> right? So Slack changed how we communicate with yeah, our staff. Slack comes up often on the show. Give me a layer deeper how you're leveraging Slack. Um, I'll give a I'll give an example. If one of our managers said, uh, "Hey, these guys, uh, I keep telling them to follow this policy, and it's not working. They're not listening to me." And I said, "Say it on Slack, so there's visibility, and then tell them to post a picture when it's done." It's the same thing, but it 
adds this very instant like, layer of accountability. Yep. It adds visibility. I mean, every restaurateur has said, I feel like I walk around and I tell 10 people the same thing and I can't remember which one I told or which one I didn't or I'm blah, blah, versus just having one place where we share information. Yeah. Um, we, um, the anxiety of, did I forget, oh my gosh, every, you know, walking down through the restaurant and the fish case guy comes up and she says, don't forget, man, those sardines are going to be three hours late. Then you go through the dining room. It's like, hey, we're out of Chardonnay. And then you walk to the back and both versus I can focus on my task at hand and know at any point yeah. I can pick up slack and see a snapshot yeah. of every granular detail in every department. Yeah, and for anybody who's not familiar with Slack, basically it's, a, it's kind of like an instant messenger platform that allows you to start threads uh, so you can basically like you can maybe it's delivery maybe it's uh, I don't know uh, manager notes maybe it's what, like whatever the topic is you can keep a thread of communication going there whenever there's a new message it, get, it will get highlighted so you can see like oh here are the new messages for the day so everybody's kind of in the, the loop for what's happening you can assign people to certain slack threads so if not everybody like if it's right. just for managers you can have a manager for, level yeah, exactly. you can have exactly. um, it, think about in our business at TJ's we have a fish market yep. whose problems and issues are very different yep. Then the catering department, who's a very different, so we have different, literally break the different departments, all have different different level of managers, can see into the different conversations. You can share files. You can, um, you can link into, I think, Dropbox or Google Drive. Um, so, I mean, it's very diverse. It, um, we, so we have a Thursday operations meeting. Um, we now share all of the data. We're going to go through that Thursday operation. We post it in that. Hey, we have a Thursday meeting channel. Here's the prime cost for this week. Hey, here's that inventory. Hey, hey guys, we keep running out of this. Is it on? Would somebody post a picture of the inventory yeah. sheet that we're using for that? Oh, hey, I can open that. Uh, hey, here it is. Oh, yeah, that's missing. That's why it must have gotten erased. Okay, I, I feel can you. fix it. I keep on mentioning I had a near AL on the show not too long ago. He wrote this book called Indistractable, and he has a whole chapter dedicated to best practices, uh, Slack best practices. If you guys are out there listening and looking to leverage Slack and best practices, I'd definitely check out that book. Anything, there's, a, there's another benefit to go Slack. Go for it. Um, Everybody has their text message thread with all their friends and it's been going for eight years and you have the inside jokes and the gifs and whatever. There's a company, we, as we all live in the internet now and we live inside our devices, there's this really cool corporate culture of, there's little inside jokes on the Slack yeah. channel I don't get, you know, there's little, <laughs> um, there's little funny kind of like, it's kind of bonding too. Yeah. There's like good natured, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, our Austin Malibu poking or one of our Dallas locations constantly posting sales or whatever we're tracking and competing. Like a little competition. For little comp comp they've nice. never met each other. Nice. And they're like, and so it's like a really fun kind of corporate to bring bond. people together. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, cool. Uh, Slack told us I had to pay extra money because there were so many gi like <laughs> gifs on there we were taking up. Like we had gone <laughs> out past our memory uh, thing. Oh, that's funny. That, that, which it. told me that we're having a good time. There's one thing I do want to bring up and it was something I was curious about. There's a lot going on right Right now in the media with you know we're, we're much more conscious about the environment and the oceans are really effed up right now like super effed up um and i'm sure you've probably seen this wave of the, or the the swell of this of people being more aware of this how have you addressed this as somebody who focuses on seafood as your, your Look, main source um it's not hypothetical to me no one stands to lose more from overfishing than the guy who owns five seafood restaurants that's how i keep a roof over my head yeah um Number one is it's real. This is not, um, you know, uh, in, <laughs> in today's culture, you kind of have to say uh, science is real, data is real, yeah. um, but there's also um, alarmism that is headline driven that isn't real. Overfishing the oceans is real. Yeah. Um, and um, so number one uh, is we get, we get this person who comes in the fish market. The, the, we hear this all the time. Hi there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't want any farm-raised fish. Um, also, I want to make sure I'm not like hurting the fish's oceans or whatever, right? So let me get this straight. You only want wild fish, but you also don't want to deplete the oceans of wild fish. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> seems like we're painting with a very narrow brush there. Number one, um, this is not even a popular sentiment in the seafood industry very much. Aqua farming is essential. Um, there is nothing wrong with farm raising fish there is something wrong with poorly farm raising fish the example i give is chicken you've never eaten a wild chicken right that doesn't so the chicken farm might make the quality of chicken that goes into mcnuggets and all the horrors of factory farming and you know that we all know 
or you might be talking about a free range organic chicken farm that is selling the best chicken on earth to the Michelin starred restaurants. Yeah. They're both a farm. We tend to talk about aqua farming as generalized. Generalized. Yeah. Okay. There are spec. There are incredible aqua farms that create pro- um, that. So what are the um, uh, this? I'll, I, I will spend the rest of your podcast talking about this <laughs> stuff if you want. Um, there are basically five factors that make whether an aqua farm is good. Number one is are they raising the fish in the environment it's supposed to be in? A North Atlantic salmon should be raised in the North Atlantic. It is it, it, it its immune system is based on the bacteria that's in that water and the blah blah blah. You start taking fish out of where they're from, and bad stuff starts happening. Number two, does that aqua farm? Um, Pro, uh, have clean water uh, uh, circulation. Everybody remembers when the filter broke on your fish tank? Nasty. It's nasty. Yeah. People tend to think of aqua farming as happening in an aquarium. That's not how it works. It's in giant open water. What you just need, uh, so the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia, that's the one where the water goes up and down 70 feet. Yeah. Um, uh, more water flows in and out of the Bay of Fundy twice a day than the combined volumetric sum of every drop of water in every freshwater river on Earth. That's crazy. Imagine if you hit pause on the Danube and the Nile and the Mississippi and the Missouri and the, every river you've ever heard of. That's how much water flows in and out of this bay that's twice a day. Incredible. So that's like so. As long as you have an area with really great water uh, circulation, you can have good aqua farming. Number three, that the aqua farm produces more um, fish protein than it takes out. There are lots of aqua farms that for every pound of fish they grow, take 1.2 pounds of fish in fish feed to feed the fish. So you are just having a net negative impact on yeah. fish, right? You're not saving the ocean. You're, yeah, you're, you're just causing another problem. Um, number four is that there uh, is the feed that they're using, that they're using high quality feed, not serving them crap. Um, and number five is just a lack of um, not not using the. I mean, you have to have some antibiotics, but just a general sense of are we doing like best practice antibiotics here, or are we completely doing uh, terrible? You know, using too many antibi- antibiotics. So that's five things. That's that, five, the, the five, best five practice. Factors. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to cover these real quick. Uh, number one, were they uh, are they raising the environment? That yes. Were they from? were they raised where they're from? Number two, filter or some type of circulation. Number three, more in more fish in than out. Net positive, you're making more fish than you're taking. Good feed is number four. Number five is best practices when it comes to antibiotics. Yes. How do, is there like a seal that we can like that covers all these that we can just like look to see if it has a seal? Is there a way? No, to, uh, okay. absolutely not. And that's one of the, I mean the same way that you know. Um, so number one is uh, you know, I've been to aqua farms. I've traveled. I've, been, I've actually been to these farms. Um, there's no way. I mean, who, who knows that, right? Yeah. So I'm happy that you're. And this is great stuff, right? Um, here. So one of the things we said, why go to a fish market? Is it's my job to know these things. You probably know in your business. You know, lawyer comes in. You know about a lot more about the law than I do. This is my weird thing. I know you yeah. can trust me. I've been to the farm. I know it's a good farm. Okay. Well, um, I'll have those five things listed in the show notes so you guys can check. And you know, these are the questions you should be asking when you're sourcing your fish. Like these are good filters to put up there. And, and part of Restaurant Unstoppable's mission is to transform the industry. The way I think we're going to do that is by sharing values and best practices. And thank you for getting into the details. It's of my that. pleasure. The yeah. question was about um, about not overfishing our oceans. Yeah. And I said, so the first thing is don't be scared of aqu- farm raised fish. Yeah. Demand great if there the more demand we have for great aqua farming, the less crappy aqua yeah. farming. There How do about. you feel about quote unquote trash fish? Are you guys trying to get into that? Yes. So uh, the technical term is bycatch. Thank you. Um, I'm really actually proud that TJ's was the first. Um, fish market to bring bycatch into Dallas, Texas. And just for anybody listening, bycatch or, or trash fish is uh, not your more traditional ca- like caught fish. Like the, um, Give some examples. So um, there are a thousand edible species of fish in the Gulf of Mexico. We target essentially four of them. Yeah, right. And throw back into the ocean 9,996 of those fish. It's, yeah. So, um, the, uh, so number one, is uh, whether you are the reddest blooded capitalist or the greenest environmentalist, this should offend you, Mm. okay? We literally throw fish back on American boats because there's no demand for the trade name, then import the same fish under a different trade name from other countries. That's terrible for the environment in terms of fossil fuels. That's terrible for our economy. We're not. We're. I mean, it's. Yeah, and these fish they're throwing back are going to die. Like, you pull a fish up from the bottom of the ocean, it's not. So a fish, uh, when... You go out fishing with your little bobber and you take a fish off the hook and you throw catch and release. On a commercial line, the stress of the commercial line is going to kill the fish almost every time. Yeah. Um, 
so it's uh, it's it's um, so this bycatch is um, so the first thing we had to do was we had to create demand. You had to, again, educate people. What is trigger fish? What is triple tail? What are these fish that we're catching that we're throwing back? And um, because the fishermen say, that's all dandy, and I love the environment just as much as you, but I, I make my money yeah. on I, my finite resource is cooler space. And why should I put a triple tail in? Um, why should I put a beard fish in? Uh, you can tell me it's delicious, and I know it's delicious, but that's just taking up the space for a grouper. Yeah, I'm like, and, a grou- day. And, and nobody's going to buy one, and somebody's going to pay ten times as much for the other. Yeah. So, so what? It was an education process. So what we did, we did something really cool. It's actually my first experience with Matt McAllister. Ended up doing the menu with Malibu Poke. We did a bycatch dinner. Um, this was before I was in the restaurant business. I was just in the fish market business. I brought the bycatch in. Matt did this amazing dinner. We invited um, media. We invited. This is pre-influencers. Yeah. Um, we invited media people. We invited restaurant buyers. We invited other chefs. And this was just a labor of love. We didn't, I mean, we just said, please, we're trying to educate everybody on this. Um, you want to hear a crazy thing? I can't get by catch in Dallas, Texas anymore. We won. There's That's now awesome. the demand outweighs the supply. The bycatch from the Gulf of Mexico, what we call third coast, essentially goes to Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. And that's it. They've even found restaurants faking bycatch, selling nor. So think about this flip. Used to be people would take crappy fish, lie and say it was the fancier fish's name, right? <laughs> Somebody would catch a, a barrel fish yeah. and lie and tell you it was a grouper. Now we have people buying the targeted fish, giving it the fake crazy name <laughs> to make it sound like it's that's trendy right now. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy, man. Well, I'm 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 appreciative of you appreciative of you getting into the detail around uh, the sustainable issues going on right now, and uh, that's probably the most detail that we've ever gotten the show. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, I like to wrap <laughs> that was up. Scratching the surface. I could I could go we could go on deeper. This. But I mean, yeah. I, I want to respect your time. One last thing I want to ask you: something I ask all my guests. Uh, the mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. So, how have you transformed since two thousand nine? When you when you paid your parents for the ability to to expand on the business, and like how how have you evolved? How have you transformed over that time? Um, I will say I have transformed as a husband and a father in not taking it home. Mm. It is the hardest thing. And you, it's somebody listening right now hears that say, oh yeah, it, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, leaving it at home and turning it off. Um, in the restaurant business, we work while everybody else relaxes, right? So then either you go and you close the bar till two in the morning because that's your relaxing day. But when you get to be a little bit older and you have a family and you want to go home, it's like, you've been working so hard during everybody's relaxation time that it's really hard to go home and relax Yeah, and not taking it home, not taking the BS of the restaurant, not taking the, the unfair criticism, um, not, or even just the ener- the frenetic energy. Yeah. Do you have like a mental practice that you exercise to make sure that you're, you know, deep detaching from the, the business before going home? Um, we talked earlier about the guest only cares why, I understood that inherently. And then it took me years to figure out why am I doing the restaurant to support this family that I have at yeah. home. <laughs> so if I come home pissy, yeah. right? You then drive your family away. Your family away. <laughs> yeah. What did I just do all that What's for? The point? So the answer to your question is um, I literally remind myself as I'm driving home, why? remember that was it's for, for this. this. Yeah, yeah. And oops, uh, again, that was for this. Um, and, and it's so simple, but it, it just kind of puts me back in that mindset. I love it, man. Great stuff. One more quick t- break to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back to bust out a true speed round. This episode brought to you by Margin Edge. Never deal with a paperwork nightmare again. We're back, and the first question I have for you is what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Um, effort. What is your biggest weakness? Uh, inability to delegate. What is one question you ask or thing you look for when you're building your team and hiring people? Tell me about the best boss you've ever had. What are you looking for? Uh, it's just, it, 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 that is the, 
they will they will tell you about their personality. The person who says the best boss I ever had just let me do my job and didn't micromanage me is someone who who values independence. Yeah. Um, the best boss I had used to let me f- go 15 minutes early. Uh, that's someone who doesn't <laughs> like to work, right? <laughs> yeah. The best they will. It is it's a it is, it is an open book question on somebody's uh, uh, how they their values. What, what they look for in work. Yeah, yeah I dig it. Uh, share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. This is a way to be, a way to act, a core value. Um, we always say here, if it would get you fired from a nine to five, you can't do it here. Okay. <laughs> like it seems very simple, but people think restaurants are pirate ships, like yeah. where basic rules of civility and society don't apply. I feel we like try to run this place like an accounting firm. What is one uncommon standard of service you teach your staff? So this is something that's common within the four walls of your business, but not common throughout the, ing- answer, the industry. Answer every question with another question. Um, people aren't necessarily... people. People eat. They eat three times a day. We always say, what's good here? Okay. Are you, we always ask two questions. Are you in the mood for fish or shellfish? Are you in the mood for something rich and decadent or light and healthy? People know what they want. It's kind of like uh, the old uh, asking your wife where she wants to go to dinner yeah. kind of thing. Um, we, uh, um, converse, we call it conversational upselling. Don't answer the question. If they already know the answer. Get it out of them. I love it. Uh, what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant yeah, operator? Tell me if I'm the first person to ever say Setting the Table by no, Danny Meyer. By far not the first person. Uh, it, it, it is cliche for a reason. That is the best book on hospitality yep. on earth. And it's 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 actually a good read and entertaining. Too. I wonder if I've sold the most copies of that book. Um, I would be curious because it is recommended so many times. And that book is on Audible. So head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable if you're not listening to the audiobooks. I don't know about you, but they've uh, changed my life. I don't know. Do you, do you partake in the audiobooks? I, I'm a music nerd. Any, <laughs> any second I'm not working, I am digesting music. What's one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do often enough or well? enough i think we uh, and i've learned this we tend to when we're creating a restaurant think why someone will come there and you we don't always think why will somebody drive by and pick something else and if you can think about why a guest won't walk in the door as opposed to obsessing over what their experience will be like once they walk in the door it changes the dynamic of how you how you serve your guests? I love it. Oh, uh, name one service you've hired or outsourced. So this could be an accountant, this could be a designer, it could be one service that you've just been blown away with that's made your restaurant better. I got a professional firm to clean my bathrooms once a week. Nice. Who are they? Uh, Cintas. Uh, so they do dish and all that. I will tell you that. Um, uh, versus the drama of trying to figure out who had to go scrub that toilet, all of whom handle food. Versus we're like, you know what? We All of us. This is something none of us want to do. Let's just go hire somebody else. And has it been cost efficient? Yes, it's great. It's a very reasonable fee. It's a weekly thing. They come in. They sanitize it with tools that I don't have, with solutions, that uh, chemicals that we don't have. And we have a sparkling bathroom. Professionally outsourced weekly bathroom cleaning. Nice. And then you're just dealing with maintaining it yeah. every day. And this next question, we kind of already answered it, but I'm going to ask it was again. That, that wasn't the sexy sexy answer to the question. <laughs> no, it was great, man. It was great. It's never been a, a toilet cleaning service has never been mentioned on the show. Yeah, so I'm that's my nugget. <laughs> uh, what is one piece of technology you've adopted within the four walls of your business that's had a huge impact on operations? You already mentioned Slack, um, but I did notice that you use Bento Box for your website. Uh, Bento Box has been great. Uh, it's very reasonable. Um, they've already figured out why websites for restaurants need to, what they need to be different than every other restaurant. I mean, every other website. And as opposed to working with a web developer and explaining what you're looking for, it's just plug and play. Reservations, you know, all your, your slideshow instantly with your Instagram. Um, your website should be dynamic. It shouldn't just be a flat billboard. It should be um, what you're telling your people on Instagram should also be on your website. What you're telling people on your email lined. newsletter should all be linked. Um, those messages should come uh, should be in real time. Yeah, and, and Bento just, is spectacular. Yeah, and, and their staff is really nice to work yeah. with. The design is great. In fact, if you uh, if you go to if you're looking for a new website in Bento, I've seen both of my websites as examples where they ask you to pick like what you want. So they clearly think they did a good job. No, they, they did a great job, and um, I do a lot of looking at websites as you can imagine when I'm researching my guests, and I can almost instantly tell when it's a Bento. Bento box site. And then that was when I landed on your website. So I was like, I bet this is Bento. I scroll down yep. to the bottom. Boom. Um, and the mobile version. You, every developer tells you that it's going to look, it's going to be great mobile. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, it, it, it's not, 
Bento is instantly great on phones, great yeah. on devices. And I, I just want to give a quick nod to Bento because they've been sponsoring the show now for years. Um, so a little plug to them. One of the one of the, the the companies I'm most proud of as a sponsor because of how good they are, and it's just an honor to align my brand with what uh, they got also, going on. Uh, Danny Meyer involvement, right? Yeah, Danny yeah. Meyer uses them. Yep, for sure. I think. I saying, I, but I thought he wasn't. He, was he involved in the startup? I don't know. I don't yeah. know the backstory. I'm interested now that you mentioned that. But great, great platform over Use there. Use Bentobox, possibly involved with Danny Meyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and just a just a quick nod and a thank you because uh, the end of our sponsorship is coming to an end. But it's been a great ride, and, and I just want to say thank you to those guys because uh, they've been making this show possible. So thank you, Bentobox. And this is the last question I have for you. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants would be lost with your departure, with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy, what would those three pieces of wisdom be? Um, uh, life is hard. Food is good. Enjoy your meals. Mm. Um, that would be one. one. Number two is uh, we don't have the responsibility to be good to people around us. We have the opportunity. Two. Um, and uh, uh, every day is a blessing. Uh, every, every day wake up is a good day. I've never tried the alternative, but I'm pretty sure it's not <laughs> as good as waking up. Three. I love it, man. This has been a great conversation. We wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. So who's one person you respect and admire in this industry, uh, look up to, and would want to hear from as a guest on the show? Who's that person? Call him out. Um, there's a guy here in Dallas, uh, uh, Jay Jerrier with Il Conoroso and Zoli's uh, Tipping Cow Creamery. Um, I think, uh, and I happen to know him personally, and I think he does amazing restaurants that more than other restaurants, he is able to kind of express himself creatively from the beginning of our podcast. Like, he's a Star Wars nerd, <laughs> but he's also uh, has like a really funny kind of uh, nerdy, uh, uh, like a kind of a uh, smart ass sense of humor. And from the art to the menu, like his personality, his very real personality comes out. I love it. And... The food, like the food, is baller. It's VPN certified, really, really good pizza. He doesn't like it's. He doesn't mess with the pizza, but then his personality comes in in every other aspect, and you kind of feel like you're at this guy's party. Yeah, and it's just really cool. And I love that. I love that mentality of your 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 restaurant being an extension of who you are, not necessarily a concept or a brand, but an extension of who you are. I, I love when I see that, and it sounds like this is what's happening. Absolutely, Jay, Jay is great. Jay, at that. look out! I'm coming after you. And uh, how can we connect with you? If we maybe want to come join your team, maybe we want to come work for you, maybe we want to be mentored by you. What's the best way to go to those fancy bento box websites and there's a <laughs> yeah. uh, submission where you can uh, um, uh, it's pretty easy work at malibu poke.com or work at tj's seafood.com i'm really proud of we uh we've had people who've worked for us for over 20 years when i took over for my family um the first thing i did was give our longest tenured employee a rate. I, I said, this is ceremonial, but I want my first official act as a business owner to give a, the guy who'd been here the longest a raise he didn't ask for. I love him, man. And uh, so, yeah, join our team. Maybe in 20 years, you'll get that on the raise you didn't ask for too. <laughs> and I'll link to those Bento Box websites in the show notes. Stick around for the closing thoughts to find out what episode number this is. I've gotten out a little too far, and I don't want to say too soon what the episode is going to be. I'm not sure yet, but uh, if you head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash whatever the episode number is, I'll link to any tool service uh, recommended, uh, how to connect with the guys over here, John, and also um, a summary of today's discussion all over there. John, thank you so much my for pleasure. taking the time. There is no questioning, my friend. You are unstoppable. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>